with basically a 1950s conception of space, which as this round table suggests, we no longer have. And so GIS, which is the first thing we're told to go to when we're making maps, basically throws us back two generations on our conception of space. We're basically doing what our advisors learned in grad school rather than even what we learned in grad school or our own new ideas. It's really not good. And GIS can do other things, but it's like very, very deep in a bag of hammers is a tiny screwdriver. And what these papers suggest is not only do we need a screwdriver, but a whole new set of tools. Um, I could give an entire talk on that, but I won't. But I would like <laughs> for, for all the panelists to just throw out an idea because you're suggesting different conceptualizations of space. And I'm being self-interested in here because I am working on grant applications on this topic. What I'd like to suggest to you is if a thought experiment, if your dean came to you and said, I'm sorry, there's no range school. I know that's not hypothetical. That feels not hypothetical at all, right? <laughs> but I do, through some very strange accounting error, have $2 million of NEH or Mellon money that you can only spend on a new mapping technology that is true to the ideas you're putting forward in this round. Uh, what would you do? I'm going to rant like, one more second here. Um, I know uh, uh, via a colleague, the idea of some of these um, uh, local conceptions of space really can resonate powerfully with what we consider our standard, which are just colonial conceptions of space. Um, my colleague, uh, 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 Martin Duesenberg pointed out that colonial officials in Australia originally thought that the idea of mapping um, seafront through the local indigenous method of where are the crocodiles was idiotic until they realized that the crocodiles live in brackish water but not in salt water. This was actually a powerful local way of being attuned to the environment and mapping the tides. Um, so there's all these ways out there. We capture these, but we see maps to what are basically colonial maps. I'm done ranting. But anyway, <laughs> that's why I got so excited about this <laughs> panel. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, I'm just done ranting for today. Just be clear. Be clear. <laughs> Um, and so it's a pleasure to welcome you all via Zoom and in person, and if you to introduce my colleague, uh, Erica Busemek. Um, I'll go to notes here. Uh, Erica is professor, uh, pr professor and Eugene C. Barker Centennial Chair in American History and UT System Regents Distinguished Teaching Professor. Uh, it doesn't say this on the webpage. She's also a fantastic colleague. And despite those two great titles, uh, systematically underappreciated, um, <laughs> maybe I've done a little to address that. It also doesn't flag an I will. She just, on the side of writing great books, runs a fantastic digital resource called Cleoviz, mm -hmm. uh, which like our other digital resource, not even task, gets unbelievable traffic from um, faculty at you know, secondary level, graduate level, all different levels, students use it's an absolutely fantastic resource. The tower sometimes notices it, but, <laughs> no, but not quite enough. Um, Professor Busemek's first book won two prizes, um, uh, yes, uh, her first book, Indian Made, Natural Culture in the Marketplace, 1868 to 1940, won the Ralph Emerson Twitchell Award and the New Mexico Book Award. Her most recent book, which is not only a good read, but a really insightful intervention uh, <laughs> into the nature of settlement and overlapping conceptions of, of space, uh, is uh, called The Foundations of the Glen Canyon Dam, Infrastructure and Dispossessions, on the Colorado Plateau. I think you've got a copy yep. to hold up. Hold up the copy. Yay, congratulations. And as a public intellectual, uh, Erica's work has appeared in Time Magazine, the Austin American Statesman, Huffington Post, Al Jazeera, and the Pacific Standard. So thank you. Okay. thank you. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. I'm moderating, they will be speaking, and then we'll have a sort of roundtable discussion. Um, I want to start with the land acknowledgement. So just um, before I begin, um, we want to acknowledge that we are meeting on indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for what is now called North America. I would like to acknowledge the Alabama Cushada, Caro, Carrizo, Kamikudo, Kawatekan, Comanche, Kikapu, Lipan, Apache, Takawa, and Isleta del Sur, 
um, all and all the American Indian and Indigenous peoples and the communities who have been or who have become part of the lands and territories in Texas. Um, I really want to deeply thank Mark um, and our co-sponsors of this event, um, the Jackson School, um, uh, Jen Graber, who personally used some of her uh, fellowship money to support us, the Institute for Historical Studies, and there are many others that are listed on the um, listed on the announcement. So I want to thank our co-sponsors. Um, it's my pleasure to formally introduce today's speakers um, for our, today's panel. I'm going to start with um, in the actually reverse order in which they're going to speak. So I'll introduce Teresa last and she'll speak first. Um, Dr. Tracy Brin Boyles is professor and department head. She took on the chair, uh, position of chair of the Department of History at, uh, the, at North Carolina State University. She is the author of two books, The Settler Sea, here's one of them, California's Salt and Sea and the Consequences of Colonialism. I'll kind of pass it around so people can see it. Um, uh, it appears in the Many West book series from the University of Nebraska Press. It was published in 2021, and it was the winner of the 2022 Cowie Prize from the Western History Association uh, for the most distinguished work on the American West and a 2022 Choice Outstanding Academic Title. She's also, also the author of Wastelanding, Legacies of Uranium Mining in Navajo Country, which was published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2015. Uh, her book, Settler Sea, is a deeply researched and inspired book. It recounts, among other things, how the Salton Sea was created when California's development company, when the California Development Company's ill-fated diversion ditch escaped the channel in 1905, um, and the flood drawn out much of the uh, Kawila, I, Kawila, Kawila uh, Torres Martinez Reservation, which had been established in 1876. And throughout the book, she really provides examples of the ways in which the Kauyas resisted their colonization. Which, and so her book is really rooted in settler colonial studies. And essentially, Tracy and I are kind of in settler colonial studies, and Andrew and Teresa are kind of in indigenous centered studies. And so that will be a theme that we'll talk about. Um, in Wastelanding, she scrutinized settler colonial constructions of landscapes in the American Southwest and created a whole new way to describe the phenomenon wastelanding that spread well that has spread well beyond the Southwest and essentially invented a new term and terminology that is now used and she's not even credited for anymore. Uh, so it just becomes part of our academic language. Uh, Andrew Curley is an assistant professor at the University of Arizona in the School of Geography, Development, and Environment. His work focuses on the everyday incorporation of indigenous nations into colonial economies. Building on ethnographic research, his publications speak to how indigenous communities understand coal, energy, land, water, and infrastructure and development in an era of energy transition and climate change. He is the author of Carbon Sovereignty, Coal Development and Energy Transition in the Navajo Nation, uh, which just came out this year with the University of Arizona Press. Um, it's a wonderful book that recounts how and why coal came to dominate the Navajo economy and the shift that occurred and is occurring when one of the Navajo Nation's largest coal plants closed. Uh, he conceptualized a carbon, carbon sovereignty to help expose and explore that central, the central mechanisms of colonialism while still very much keeping the focus on tribal sovereignty and individual agency. It's a wonderful book, a wonderful um, way to conceptualize of uh, various complicated phenomena that are happening across the, um, across the West and Navajo Nation more uh, specifically, and I encourage you all to read it. Broadly speaking, his research focuses on indigenous incorporation into colonial capitalism or forms of exploitation linked to resource extraction and underdevelopment. From 2012 to 2014, he conducted ethnographic fieldwork within the Navajo Nation regarding the future of the Navajo Generating Station. This research is uh, featured in his book in car on carbon sovereignty. He has a new research um, project that hopefully we'll hear a little bit about as well. Uh, he is Diné and an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. And finally, Teresa Montoya is a social scientist whose research uh, and media production focuses on contemporary problems of toxic contamination and water insecurity in relation to historical legacies of land dispossession and resource extraction across the indigenous Southwest. Her current manuscript, Permeable Diné Policy, Politics of Extraction and Exposure, draws upon the exposure, the ethnography, and oral history to analyze ongoing environmental and legal impacts for Diné communities following the 1979 Church Rock uranium spill and the 2015 Gold King mine spill across Navajo Nation. Her broader research interests include tribal jurisdiction and sovereignty around environmental issues, 
climate justice and water governance of the Colorado River. Her research has been published in the American Journal of Public History, Cultural Anthropology, Anthropology, etc. many different journals. She's also a filmmaker. Um, in addition, she has curatorial, uh, curatorial experience at various institutions, including the Peabody Essex Museum, the National Museum of the American Indian, and the Field Museum, while she's, where she served as, uh, most recently as a guest curator. Um, and she has an amazing, uh, she has like an amazing bio and portfolio, and we're really looking forward to her book coming out soon, so we can hold that up. And go to her <laughs> um, so the concept of this panel that you are, um, that they're going to present on, our goal as scholars, we've been talking about this for over a year now, um, was to really critically historicize the Colorado Compact's commemoration. Uh, we had hoped to hold this um, uh, on the 100th anniversary of the Colorado River Compact last year in 2022, but I got COVID, so we had to actually shift things around. Um, but we wanted to place that moment in history in a longer, um, in longer uh, context. Um, and so we had started to talk about how the compact, the Colorado River Compact, which divided up the um, waters of the Colorado River between the seven states, um, and we'll talk, Teresa will probably tell us a little bit more about that, and we can talk more about that as a panel. Um, we wanted to place that larger uh, agreement within the context of settler colonial dispossession and governance. So over a number of meetings in the past year, um, our work and our own, and through our own work on water, energy, and environmental justice, all four of us kind of work in that area. For the past few years, we've been thinking about the compact, the river, the people, the plateau, the infrastructure, and the future of the region, how this all ties about. So today's panel is an extension of those conversations and the work that we've all been doing. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the IHS. And I'm finally excited this is happening. <laughs> um, so uh, Teresa, I'm gonna turn things over to you now. Sure. And I will share. Yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we have to start with a bunch of white men. <laughs> That's where our story starts. Um, so this, I'm just going to provide some historical context. Um, I realize that for for folks gathered here, there is a Colorado River locally, and um, we are coming from a different Colorado. <laughs> Um, in case anyone was confused about what Colorado River we're talking about. Um, so this photograph here, which is kind of iconic in terms of, you know, the, the history of the, the compacts um, signing in November of 1922, um, Herbert Hoover is, is featured in the center, along with uh, representatives from the seven Western states. So the Colorado Compact um, you know, is um, in its imagining as representative of only the seven uh, basin states. And, and we can also kind of interrogate, you know, like how the basin itself is imagined. Um, let's see, how do I get rid of this? Oh, just um, um, collapse it up on the side. Take the top right. Yeah. Let me get my mouse to We should stay here. No, we. Um, this is also, um, you know, interesting to consider, right? It's just the, the, the fictitious allocation of water that actually did not exist. And this was based <laughs> on, the, um, you know, the, the idea that there was at the time, um, you know, 15,000 acre feet of water to divide equally. Um, we can also interrogate what the notion of equity is or equitable division. Um, you know, 7,500 acre feet or 70, yeah, 7,500 acre feet to uh, the upper basin states um, and then 75 to lower basin states. Mexico was not even considered part of this equation in 1922. Um, and this, this allocation was later tacked on. So they just came up with like, oh, here, we'll give Mexico 1,500 acre feet, even though that's already um, exceeding the original so-called water pie that they imagined. Um, in, in a meeting that we had discussed, you know, the, the imaginary water pie, um, I was at a, a Western Colorado water meeting last summer, and they gave out all of these like little trinkets for attendees, and one of them was a pizza slice cutter, which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> um, 
And I realized it's because this, um, this, this common assumption of, you know, the apportionment of water as, as a high. So that's why they gave out this little picture of that water, <laughs> which I thought was a very like uh, a crude representation. In any case, um, we, we now know that, um, you know, contemporary hydrological science tells us, you know, this water does not exist. We do not have 1500 or, you know, 1600, 500 acre feet um, to give away or million acre feet to give away. Um, and even that imaginary back then was likely um, not correct. Um, so we are, we are left with this contemporary problem of um, we are over allocated. Um, but even that itself is, is an imaginary of Western hydrological science. Um, so what we want to bring into these conversations, you know, beyond climate change, which also, you know, mostly focuses on, you know, hydrology, um, you know, is like who was left out of these discussions in 1922, um, which is, you know, informed by not only like racist or nationalist ideologies of not including, you know, uh, lower basin users such as Mexico, but also the over 30 tribes who are part of the Colorado River Basin itself. Um, so this map, um, we love maps. Um, <laughs> it's kind of hard to see um, if I can zoom in at all, but um, I like this map because one, it, it identifies um, the various cities, but also the tributaries, right? So the diff um, to your um, question, I can't, sorry. Mark, Mark, Mark. Mark. yes. And, and when you were asking about, you know, how can we remap or reimagine, you know, I think, um, our relationships to watersheds, I think, um, maybe can be more in line with indigenous, like localized understandings of, of water. Um, I mean, a lot of ways, because of the compact, it, it forces this singular imaginary of the Colorado River itself, but there's all of these other tributaries and watersheds all that extend beyond the banks of the Colorado River. Um, and in this sense, this, you know, brings folks from New Mexico or the Rio Grande River Valley who, you know, seemingly sometimes are left out of the imaginary of being, you know, part of the, the Colorado River um, imaginary. So um, I've been thinking about that a lot as well, like um, the power of, of mapping, but also of naming. And Andrew and I have also had these conversations that, um, Prior to 1921, the Colorado River was not known as the Colorado River in Colorado. Um, so as a little aside, um, I was born and raised in Grand Junction, Colorado, which um, you see is at the, it's about 30 miles east of the Utah Colorado border. Um, it's named for the confluence of what was formerly the Grand River, now the Colorado River and the Gunnison Rivers. Um, the Colorado River um, before 1921, um, it's imagined headwaters were actually in Utah at the confluence of the Green River and um, Grand Rivers. So um, these these namings, I think, the shifting imaginary even of the naming of the river itself um, also kind of shows the short sightedness of a, a settler relationship to this land, this place. You know, what what would be all of the um, ways that indigenous peoples imagined the Colorado River? Colorado itself is, of course, the Spanish name Colorado, which is in reference to the reddish hue of the river itself um, when the sediment was churned up. Um, so we can kind of like interrogate multiple colonial imaginaries um, across the indigenous Southwest and, um, and also, you know, various property regimes that lay claim to what we now refer to as the Colorado River. Um, so just very quickly, um, as we were discussing before, you know, a lot of the, the so-called crisis of the Colorado River now is increasingly framed in terms of, of climate change. So this um, photograph here, it, there's, a, there's a lot of these aerial photographs that this is a very iconic image, right? It shows the, the so-called bathtub ring around Lake Powell, um, the depletion of, the, of um, the water. This is also, you know, a man-made lake, which is, this didn't exist prior to the damming of the river. Um, same for Lake Mead. Um, so, you know, what is it, what would it mean to return the rivers to their wild, um, or even wild in and of itself as a settler imaginary, right? The, the notion of taming the river, containing the river. Um, I know Erica will be, or uh, Trace will be speaking about dams. 
uh, also as like a, a settler form of containment or enclosure. Um, so getting to beyond these settler fictions or imaginaries, um, these are some of the major tribes of the Colorado River Basin. And this does not even come close to naming all of them. There's you know, close to um, 30 different tribes. Um, uh, and also, you know, in terms of our, the constitution of our group here, um, part of the, the, the premise of this panel is, we, you know, we want to create an edited volume. Yes. Um, and I think you will speak more to that call for proposals. Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but even, even in the con <laughs> preview, um, but even in the constitution of our own group, you know, um, so Erica and I thinking through um, upper basin relationships and Tracy and Andrew thinking through lower basin relationships, which is also kind of funny that we've divided ourselves along these imaginaries because even you know the um, the upper basin and lower basin division at Page is also just a, a fiction. So all of this I keep pointing back to is just this it, it's seemingly arbitrary of how these things um, came to be and yet um, you know there's a presumed fixity of like what the basin is and its location and who can, who is able to lay claim to water um, from the respective basins. Um, in thinking about the exclusion of indigenous people in the original um, uh, signing of the compact, um, I just want to draw our attention to um, the compact meeting minutes itself. Um, so leading up to the signing of the compact, um, there was only one, a few lines spoken through the entire meeting. Um, and it was just a throwaway line of like, well, what about the tribes? Um, Mr. Hoover, President Hoover says near the bottom, the Indian question is always prominent in every question of the West. And you always find some Congressman who was endowed with looking after the Indian who will bob up and say, what is going to happen to the poor Indian? We thought we would settle it while we were at it. Um, so in summary, his only concern about so-called Indians is that some congressman would you know, interject. So we might as well include a provision within the Colorado Compact itself so that there can be no question or squabble about that. This is the article that was then included in the Colorado Compact. This is the only mention of tribes in the entire entirety of the compact, which states, nothing in this compact shall be construed as affecting the obligations of the United States of America to Indian tribes, which really doesn't say that much at all. Um, so I, as I mentioned, there were seven um, basin states who you know, had representatives who were part of the discussions in the compact. None of the basin tribes were included in these discussions which means that the allocation, you saw the apportionment um, of you know, 7,500 million acre feet to each of the basins did not include tribes. And as uh, Western water law um, states is on this theory of prior appropriation and for, for indigenous tribes, that means their um, uh, date of, of um, establishment of reservation is when they can set a priority date to try to secure water rights. Maybe Andrew can go more into the the twisted logic of um, <laughs> of apportionment. The first twisted logic question to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's good at twisted logic. <laughs> um, I don't know where I'm at in terms of my time right now. Yeah. 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 Okay. So for any of you who have been, I'm just trying to like bring us up to yeah. to contemporary debate. So. It's in terms of, um, you know, the Colorado Compact that that obviously has contemporary reverberations and how that overlaps with um, debates over water policy for tribes, I think, um, you know, kind of came to a head this summer. Um, so this is actually a, a, a painting from, what do you call it, a court painting? Court sketch. Court sketch uh, from, I believe, April or March um, of this year. Um, so Frederick Liu, who is assistant to the U.S. Solicitor General, is presenting for four SCOTUS yet in March 2023 um, to hear about um, a, a case that Navajo Nation had brought before the Supreme Court, um, essentially arguing that 
that our nation, like we had insured water rights because of our treaty, which is basically what is assured through what is called um, the Winters Decision of 1908. So at the date of establishment of reservation that we would be insured access to water. Um, however, by, by June of this year, um, the, the Supreme Court ruled in a 5-4 decision that the United States had no affirmative duty um, to the Navajo Nation to secure water. Um, so once again, I think this, like the haunting legacy of the Colorado Compact is that, you know, not only the federal government and states, you know, disavowing their responsibility um, to tribes and, and, and insofar as, you know, federal water law is concerned for indigenous peoples, this is a federal question, right? Um, but the way that the Colorado Compact is set up is those questions fall to the states. So we're kind of left in this ambiguous space between what the state's apportionment of water is to, um, to lower and upper basin usage through the compact, and then the federal obligations that should be insured through treaties um, to tribes. And so this is why, um, you know, this is, this is not, this is important, not only, um, you know, for tribes today, because we don't actually have a, a strong legal um, holding within, you know, settler law, um, but also because of the impacts of climate change, and we see these dwindling water resources across um, our nations. Um, and I think um, the, you know, Western water law also, I think, um, like demands a, a, an increased use of water in order to like lay claim to that water. And um, that's fundamentally at odds with, you know, indigenous ontologies of water, which is actually more about sustainability or not wasting water, um, but how can you increase your claim or right to it unless you were practicing very like water heavy um, activities like industrial agriculture. Um, so that's also just another, another way that, um, you know, Western water law, like prioritize certain sorts of, of uses, which is really kind of, um, I think, based on these like lock in property notions of you have to put something to beneficial use, you have to perform labor upon the land or water in order to lay claim to it, rather than trying to preserve it for future generations. Um, I will leave it at here for now. I have more more comments about <laughs> um, about my my interests and how I you know I plan to to think about um, about the Colorado Compact moving forward. But I think with Tracy's comments, we can kind of tie it into the the edited volume, and I'll hand it over to Andrew. All right. So I'll stop sharing. So you should share. I will share my slides. Sorry, I've done Zoom for so many years now, and I always <laughs> forget how to do this. Okay, share. I call it a Texas presentation. Because we are in Texas. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, it's, a, it's a new thing for me. Um, you're all here all the time, so. Um, <laughs> geography. <laughs> Your discipline is coming out. Right, it's coming out. <laughs> Where are we? Um, <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate the uh, hospitality. It's great to be here at the uh, University of Texas. Austin, is that how you call it? Um, yeah, definitely, um, you know, an institution that I've heard about and been close to when we were at a NASA conference here in 2014. Uh, but it's my first time here on campus, so it's really nice to be here and, and enjoy your hospitality. Um, so let me start my timer so I can keep track of what I'm doing here. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the ways that I've seen the Colorado River taken from Indian nations in law and in practice in um, the lower basin. And it, 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 by implication, it also is talking about the upper basin. Because it turns out the basins are acting as using similar colonial techniques. I'm starting out with this story, and sorry for any of my U of A colleagues who are on here, they've seen this presentation versions of this. I'm going to do it a little bit differently. So, um, but um, we're starting out with a news story. Uh, this was from already a couple of years ago, but it's talking about how there's uh, a water cuts declared because of a historic drought. 
And so for me, I was really interested in this idea of drought and these drought narratives that are generating this anxiety, this, uh, this feeling of crisis, especially like where I'm living in Tucson and in Phoenix and in the, um, in the, um, the, the, the Sonoran Desert, the, um, the, the, the places where, you know, there's a lot of importation of Colorado River water, you know, this has become an existential crisis. This is a big part of like everyday life. You know, this is how we use water and how we are able to survive in these areas in something that looks like a modern uh, lifestyle, right? So that's something that is generating a unique kind of feeling of crisis and anxiety in the lower basin states, especially in Arizona. Arizona has a really interesting, complicated history, especially with, with this kind of arrangement with the other states on the dividing of the Colorado River. But so this crisis, you know, is part of the narratives. It's a national news story, people are talking about it and saying, you know, we're going to have historic drought, right? This is causing um, this crisis. And as we as are gathering here, uh, the, how many of us? Four of us. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not in the math part. The four of us, as we're gathered here, um, we're, we're taking that idea of crisis and moving it backwards temporarily, right? And that's why we have historians here to help, help us with that. So like, um, I think Erica was talking about this. Tracy was talking about this earlier today. Um, so this is like shared idea that we have about like the crisis as something that is not in 2021, but goes back to 1922 and earlier, especially for Indian nations, right? This is when the laws of the river, the law of the river, as it's called, starts to cement. And it becomes something that is depriving of Indian nations of access and rights and claims to the water. And whether or not we ought to have rights in the sense that we want to withdraw and exploit as much as possible is another question. We'll talk about that shortly. But just the fact that our access to the water is denied through the way that um, the states have organized the division of the water, as Teresa has shown, um, is, is a colonial question. And so we're saying that it's not a climate change question, it's a colonial question. That's the nature of the crisis for the Colorado River. So looking back, even just going back a few years by historical terms, right, into the into 1965 uh, Arizona Republic paper, or no, no, this is New York Times. It literally says New York Times. So the New York Times uh, paper, we see that there's yet another like environmental crisis that is, is talked about. And this is when they're building the Coolidge Dam. And this one of the tributaries that contributes to the Colorado River. Tributaries play an important role in how we calculate and divide the river. Um, they're seen as a state's water, it's seen as state's water contributing. Right, it was part of the the calculus going into the negotiation, um, or it was a part of the debate of whether or not. Anyway, it's a, a little bit of a footnote, but it's important to keep in mind the tributaries that that come into the Colorado River. The Gila River is a really important one. It goes through two Indi Indian nations, both their traditional land and also where their reservations are currently. Those aren't always the same thing, and what is happening in um, in in uh, the 1960s here is that the Gila River have rights to water uh, by virtue of using that water since time immemorial, since being there before uh, Phoenix was ever thought of, since uh, you know the state of Arizona was was uh, thought of, um, when uh, many people didn't know much about that area. You know the Gila River, the Gila people are descended from the Hohokam civilization that, that exists in the Salt River Valley in um, where modern day Phoenix is. So they've been there for, for uh, hundreds of uh, years. And, um, and so their claims to the water are, are, are greater than any of the settlers, or at least they ought to be. But what happens is with the establishment of the reservation, the way that water starts to be diverted in that area in central Arizona is that a lot of the waters are being moved into new farms that are by white settlers, by Mormons that are um, that uh, that uh, uh, Erica talks about in her book, this Mormon ideology, um, especially in Mesa, um, in in the eastern part of Phoenix. Like there's um, a, the diversion of water away from the Gila River uh, by settlers that are then preventing uh, a traditional access to water by the Gila River Indian community, who then are calling upon the federal government to ensure their access. So it becomes this federal question in some ways. So it's like 
the state and and the 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 commu settler communities like the town and the municipalities and these new communities that are starting to form they they don't seem to care i mean they they don't care it's not they don't seem to they don't care about the federal obligation to ensure water to indian water uh, to indian communities this is actually like a for lack of a better term like a frontiers question right we're talking about the the um the late 19th century so i'm going on long on this story but um but the point is that because of the diversion that happens downstream from the gila river and the creation of new towns like coolidge and this other community that's now a ghost town called adamsville they um and there's a lot of speculative uh, land estate sales and all sorts of stuff that was property and local people who had insider knowledge in fact the person who created this town worked for the bia he knew what the federal obligation was and, and was like okay i can buy up land here and create this new town sell it to new people coming in and and created a small corporation that diverted money that created canal that diverted money and i'm going to show you a picture of that into that new town so moving water to, to land that he owns away from the gila river and then leaving that obligation to the federal government so that was a way to gain money right that was a a scamming of the system at that point and what happens is then the federal government rather than denying that whole process says we're going to create a dam upstream and uh and we're going and what happens is they flood uh san carlos apache land in order to meet their obligations to the Gila River. So it gets complicated. It's not one for one land loss. It's like layers of dispossession over time and layers of colonial violence in different forms over time. And so what happens here is while they while the Coolidge Dam is built and the flood and the waters start to rise, um, you can hear, you can read this and I pulled a snippet out of this um, out of this story and it's full of racist uh terminal uh, language so i apologize for that but they write the the, the 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 author of this report says as a matter of fact the gila river flow figures used by engineers to justify building the dam apparently originated in a distant and far wetter clim climate which is what Teresa was talking about with the division of the the, the river in 1922 for the reservoir has never been completely full and the irrigation potential of 100,000 acres has been only half realized. If one were to ask old timers among the San Carlos Apache tribe on whose reservation the dam and reservation squat, interesting racist language there, <laughs> he might get the Apache equivalent of, I told you so, for the reservoir floods sacred grounds and the gods cannot be appeased, obviously a racist throwaway line there. But the point is, at that time, even the science was wrong. The environmental predictions were wrong. So this idea that climate change explains everything, I think is part of our problem here. And why we have to look at, oh, there's all sorts of colonial acts happening. There's all, an ontology of resource use at work that continually outstrips the availability of the resources to supply what they're asking the resources to do. Like it's basically asking for more than is possible and and every time that happens the peoples who are paying the price for a uh, continuation for another generation of unsustainable life in the area are indian people so that's why we need to think about this as a colonial crisis and not just simply a climate crisis so we can look at some of the language that came out during the time of reclamation this big air big dam development the capturing of water supply and taming of it to use these frontier metaphors and Roosevelt who uh was um you know revered and actually has a dam named after him came and christened the the salt the Roosevelt what's now the Roosevelt dam that dams the salt river says uh the reclamation of the unsettled arid public lands presents a different problem here it is not enough to regulate the flow of streams so you're not just doing science the object of the government is to dispose of the land to settlers literally telling you what you should do uh who will build homes upon it to accomplish this object water must be brought within their reach so it's diverting water it's about environmental engineering science is not an issue it's about how do we transform the environment to match the need of settlers so indian resource needs are not an issue a federal obligation to secure water rights for tribes is not an issue, although this predates Winter's decision. The point is they need to transform the landscape that they're encountering into something that looks more familiar to them. 
we talk about this in our geography classes. So <laughs> this is kind of like the first lesson and then half of the moment goes down. Uh, <laughs> they're like, I didn't sign up for this. Anyway, so um, so here are some images of these dams being constructed. Um, the uh, the dam on the uh, um, the left is the original uh, um, part of the Salt River Dam, the, the Rose what becomes the Roosevelt Dam. There's a conceptualization of what the Coolidge Dam will look like in the upper right. It's a drawing. It's like this, like what Teresa was saying, a colonial imaginary. So that's an example of a colonial imaginary at work. Down at the lower um, hand corner is the uh, is a Florence Canal, the one I referenced earlier. It was it was uh, paid for by a private uh, company that was got, came together and moved diverted that water from the Gila River into that community of Adamsville, which you know was then. Uh, was then going to be an, irrig an irrigation area, uh, a place where you can grow crops. And then that's a construction of, I believe that's the Roosevelt Dam again at the bottom. So you can see these tributaries being choked and then those waters become reservoirs for settlers against the uh, interests of Gila and Apache nations in the area. So, and that's what modern day Phoenix is built on, this kind of uh, uh, interaction with water. Um, now, when we move forward in time, uh, this is where my research starts to pick up in uh, in uh, 1964 through and 66 is, or 67 is when this uh, map is created. Um, this is at a time when Arizona uh, is running out of those resources from the Salt River and uh, and the aquifer waters that uh, that Phoenix was relying upon. And when I was saying Arizona, I meant Phoenix. Uh, when Phoenix is relying on uh, is outstripping its its ability to sustain itself from water. Water is an existential crisis at this point, too. You read the Arizona Republic, you read the editorials during this time, uh, the letters from Carl Hayden, they're all like in this crisis narrative. The same thing we hear about today about drought, which is attributed to climate change. Mm -hmm. But at this time, it's like we're not getting our fair share of allocation. California is a villain. Um, you know, all of this. There's all sorts of other things that are the problem. But Arizona feels like it's the victim in all of this. And that uh, um, what what they need to do is they need to realize their water rights, whether that be in the form of building the this canal system themselves or getting the federal government to do it. And at this time, we have Stuart Udall, who is the Secretary of Interior, um, and Carl Hayden is uh, a senior uh, senator in Congress. And so they say the time is right for us to make this kind of move. We have enough power in the federal government. It, it's um. It's at this time, this is actually coming out of Stuart Udall's papers at the University of Arizona. I was just like flipping through them. Well, they didn't let me flip through them. I had to put gloves on this. <laughs> As you all probably encounter in your own work. And um, and I saw this, this was like a projection of what, what was the project that I ended up doing my the book on. Uh, uh, th it's a Navajo generating station. So this proposed thermal power plant uh, assumed location. And the backstory behind this, gosh, I'm probably way over time. Now. The backstory behind, oh, I'm 14 minutes in. Okay, I'll wrap this up. The backstory behind this is that um, this was a compromise between environmentalists and and uh, and and um, and in in the state of Arizona and other um, governing officials like Utah who wanted to create uh, the CAP, the Central Arizona Project, and needed a power source for it. They thought they were going to put two hydroelectric dams uh, just north of the present day boundaries of the Grand Canyon. But that's when the Sierra Club and others mounted a campaign against that. And we got a coal fired power plant as the environmental solution for that time. You know, that was seen as like, oh, because environmentalism, as you recall, was about preservation of nature. It was about cre maintaining uh, scenic places like the Grand Canyon. In places like Black Mesa, which is not as prioritized. In fact, there's um, language in congressional testimony that I write about in the, in the article called Colonial Beachheads, where a well known environmentalist is saying it's too bad that this is going to be strip mine, but it's not as iconic of a landscape as Grand Canyon. So we're willing to make that trade on your behalf, Navajo Nation. So, <laughs> so, um, so this, uh, this canal gets built. Um, actually, for a second time, I'm going to skip over that. And what I think is really interesting is now we're kind of at a point where we're rethinking that whole narrative. And, and why this image is like taken in down, a couple of pictures taken downtown Phoenix. So where CAP was signed into law 
after it was passed in Congress. It was signed at this place called the Westward Ho Hotel. You can see in the background of that um, that that picture there. And uh, and Lyndon Johnson, whose papers are all over here, maybe he has some pictures here, uh, was actually signing. Flew out to Phoenix and signed it there in that in that um, building. And now, uh, where my research uh, started in 2012, I actually was following these Native artists who made this mural in the foreground which is a critique of that whole process. It's a critique of cap, which is represented in that like, like green orange hose and how it's bringing water to, uh, to, uh, to Phoenix represented in the form of golf courses and like frivolous uses of water. And it centers the Diné and Tahana Adam ontology in, this, in the middle of the mural. That's Mother Earth, uh, that's a changing woman, sorry, and that's uh, with uh, pregnant with warrior twins, and that's the first man basket by the Tana Adam, who are the who are the people who live in that area, both in near Tucson and up into uh, um, up into Phoenix. So it's actually countering the modernist narrative that is uh, materializing Cap, and that is part of the Navajo Generating Station that has since been demolished, but like that is kind of represented in that building in the background. So I think it's an interesting critique. With, and it's accidentally close to the signing of this, of where uh, CAP happened. There wasn't an intentionality behind it. It was just a building that was allowing them to use that space to make the mural uh, at the time. So it's really interesting. So now we're moving into, um, I'm just going to give you an example of an alternative form of governance. So, you know, we've already kind of gone over like, how Arizona has seen itself. And I use this at, in my geography classes too, as an example, like the state seal. You know, we, I just learned recently that I'm not allowed to use this without the state's permission. So I'm like breaking state law. Yeah. <laughs> I'm putting this up here. I guess. Um, I'm, a, I'm aware, I've just revealed I'm aware of this too. Um, <laughs> but uh, sorry, Arizona. But like, um, you can see the whole like ontology. The ontology is how we think about resources and nature around us. And you can see how that's represented in the state seal with the mining industry, the cattle industry, the agriculture and the dam in the background. The damming is a, a big part of that narrative. And then, you, so I'm saying like, mo, like there's modern governance in Arizona that is like, that is reprioritizing a different kind of ethic around land. And you look even at the seal of the Tonado Nation and it really, it, it, prior, it, um, so it focuses on earth as it exists, right? Uh, the mount, on the sacred mountain for, for that nation, the saguaro cactus, you know these uh, these these natural plants that are part of the Sahara Desert that uh, support an economy, a sense of politics, a whole uh, culture and organization, uh, social organization that has existed much longer than than the current cities of Phoenix and it's or just basically Phoenix metro area has existed, and that can offer us. Uh, alternative ways of thinking about our survivability in the region. And we, we can talk about more of that in question and answer. Um, one last thing I want to say before I close uh, my presentation is one of the big things that even though we're talking about the Colorado River, I think it, the one of the big things that we're thinking about are dams and the role dams play in our climate narratives. And um, and I think like the biggest story we have right now is the catastrophic flooding in Libya, right? The amount of, of I just can't even conceptualize the, the amount of, of death that's occurred there. And it's, I can't think of a good way to talk about it, but what I've heard, and I'm sorry that I'm doing this like uh, off the cuff, like analysis, I don't know enough about the details of the thing, but what I heard is like a lot of people talking about like, oh, are places uh, ready for climate change or are they, you know, all these floods and all these waters. But, you know, what we're talking about are dams that have uh, failed. And so we really need to re-interrogate dams and damming. And I wouldn't be surprised if I learned that those things were funded by the World Bank, that they were part of a large development initiative, you know, decades ago. So these are in tandem with what's going on or what happened in Indian country, I think. Uh, um, Erica can talk about that with the Glen Canyon Dam and how that would pre-sage what happened in like, especially a lot of North Africa, like a lot of the dams mm -hmm. along those rivers. So I'll stop there. Am I sharing? You want me to? No, I'll do it. I need to unshare. Sorry, I pushed it over now. Oh, yeah. Or is it unshared?
Yeah, you just stop sharing. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I close my face. So I can be okay with everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit. First of all, hi, and thank you for being here. And I especially want to thank um, Erica and Courtney. Or Courtney is Courtney is the one who got us all organized and together and in the same place. <laughs> thank you, Courtney. <laughs> um, uh, I'm actually. Not... I think that's okay. You all don't mind looking at it like this. Is that all right? I'm just gonna go ahead and put it like that. Um, it's not ideal, but we're working with what we have here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, I thought a lot about what I wanted um, to present and talk about today, and I thought I'm a little less uh, exhausted by the Salton Sea than I used to be, so maybe I'll just talk a little bit about the Salton Sea um, and talk with you all about um, the theme of um, consequences. So I wanted to um, uh, just kind of, you know, Andrew, um, spoke a lot about crisis narratives and how we think about the Colorado River as, in, um, a, you know, on the brink of crisis. Um, and I think one of the things that we're interested in doing is situating that kind of um, concern about the state of environmental catastrophe um, and thinking about historicizing um, what we think of as an emergency. Because um, for a lot of um, peoples along the Colorado River, um, the consequences of settler colonial management or mismanagement of landscapes and, and water resources has been a catastrophe for a very long time. Um, so the Salton Sea, I think, is a good place um, to think about catastrophe um, because it was, according to many, especially settler narratives, um, born out of catastrophe. Um, and I think just sort of contextualizing what we think of when we think of an emergency. So this is an aerial view um, of the Salton Sea. I'll talk about why I'm calling these comments where consequences collect um, in just a minute. Um, this is uh, you know, just a bigger version of that. This is in Southern California. What you see along the coastline there is San Diego. You see the US-Mexico border kind of superimposed on this. Uh, this is a NASA photograph, so this is actually taken from space. Uh, one of the things I like about this image is that you can see that there's a wildfire that was burned out when this image was taken, which seems uh, appropriate for Southern California these days, unfortunately. Um, and I wanted to start with this image in particular because what you can see here is um, evidence of the argument that I want to make today, which is that the Salton Sea is and should always be seen as part of the Colorado River watershed. Uh, and resituating it as part of the watershed is part of the kind of healing work that I'm that I'm hoping that um, happens around salt and sea politics. Um, but what you're looking at here is the um, the part of the lower basin of the Colorado River, um, and um, the canal systems that deliver water from it up into. Um, the Salton Sea. So the Salton Sea, for those of you who are not familiar, is, called, is the state of California's largest inland body of water. Um, it's one that has been wrapped up in um, discourses of calamity and environmental crisis for a number of years, um, really since it was um, formed from 1905 to 1907. Um, and it's also one that's creating a number of environmental health problems and ecological problems for the area surrounding it. And the reason why, uh, well, part of the reason why it's causing um, sort of massive environmental injustice and environmental health problems is something that you can see evidence of in this slide. It's the fact that the um, Salton Sea's um, water level has been sustained um, for the, the duration of um, the 20th and now the 21st century. Um, from water runoff from the two agricultural districts that you can see here. This is Imperial Valley and this is Coachella Valley. Um, both of these valleys, um, the Imperial Valley has always been irrigated from water from the Colorado River. Uh, the Coachella Valley has been irrigated with Colorado River water and aquifer water, um, which is part of the homelands of the desert um, Cahuilla Nation. Um, since about um, the, the canals diverted Colorado River water up here since um, about 1940. So I want to, um, in some ways, kind of trouble what we think of as the Colorado River watershed. Um, Mark set me up for this question, basically, you know, <laughs> and thinking about 
Um, how do we conceptualize what a river is? Um, and how do our imaginaries and our metaphors that we use for understanding what a river is um, uh, set us up for particular ways of thinking about solving problems or allocating resources? Why so I keep badgering Teresa about the, the pizza cutter um, thing, because for me, it's, it's, it's such a, a, a giveaway for how certain kinds of policymakers are thinking about what constitutes a river. Um, and whether or not you are coming from a worldview that sees a, a, a waterway as a, a fixed thing, a resource to be cut up and distributed, um, or if you see it as a living, um, a living being um, that you're in uh, conversation with. This slide is for all the students in the room. As soon as you start to do research on something, you start to see it everywhere. This is about your concrete in Norman, Oklahoma, where I used to walk, walk my silly doofus dog. And every time I walked past it, I was like, is that the Salton Sea? Is it following me around? Um, and so there's the, you know, if you're doing a research project, if you're a student, suddenly it just seems to be appearing everywhere and haunting you in your daily life, just know that you're not alone. And that's not a strange thing. Um, so we, I've, we've shown you a couple of visualizations of the upper and lower basins and, and um, Teresa's presentation really underscored how artificial, what an imposition that is on the, on the river and on its water. Um, but one of the things that I want to, to quibble with are these kinds of visualizations of the watershed. Here you can see the Salton Sea is not really included in this lower basin watershed. This is based on this um, almost imaginary version of the, the river um, as reaching the Gulf of California, which it really doesn't um, anymore. Uh, it doesn't reach the Gulf of California anymore. That's how overtaxed and overallocated its waters have been. Um, but as I said, I want to make an argument here that the Salton Sea is part of um, the watershed. And that's not because I think that the Salton Sea has FOMO and like wants to be included <laughs> in the Colorado River. And it's not what it, that's not the purpose of this here. Um, but uh, since I've been thinking about the Salton Sea for, you know, many, 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 many years, um, what I've come to think of it as is, is really, um, in some ways, a microcosm and in some ways, a cautionary tale. So when we're trying to imagine what kinds of um, climate futurities that we're headed for, um, I think paying attention to um, uh, some of the, the kind of flashing red lights can be very, very useful. Um, and um, the salt and sea sort of uh, constitutes one of those. And so I want to argue today that the, the Colorado River has always been part of, um, or the salt and sea has already been, always been part of the Colorado River watershed. This is evidence of this. This is um, settlers' first evidence that that might be true. Um, this is a flooding that, that took place in 1891. Um, this area was um, settled not long before that, these were some of the first settlers that came to this part of the California desert. They were settling on desert Kauia and desert Kumeyaay land, um, and also up in um, Quechan and Chemehuevi land, um, and displacing those indigenous peoples as they were doing. So they used the labor for, you know, they employed them for um, wage labor first, um, and then um, shunted them off um, into reservations. And one of the first things that happened when, when settlers arrived and what they were already calling imperial, which I think is adorable, <laughs> um, was what native peoples had been warning about, warning them about since settlers first arrived in this area. One of the first things that native people told them when settlers arrived here is be careful <laughs> because the river floods here. Um, and sometimes it makes massive bodies of water and sometimes it makes small enough bodies of water that it will do things like wash out sands of mesquite trees and bring in new seeds and all those different kinds of things. Um, they built a town here anyway, um, and almost immediately it flooded. And one of the things I love about this image is just the kind of the, the perplexed vibe um, of people just sort of wondering where this water came from. This is Colorado River water. This is the actual. I see it online. Yeah, too. I see it online too. This is what it's, it's on. It's showing up. Oh, no. it's, it's showing up. All right. Can I get a thumbs up from somebody on Zoom if you're seeing an image of a railroad track? Yes, it's showing. How odd. Okay. Well, shoot. This room in person can't see this great image. Sad. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is this is the famous flooding that formed the um, Salton Sea. At this point, settlers knew that it was coming from the Colorado River. Um, 
in the genre of questions about what the river actually is, there are times when it's easy to doubt that it's even a body of water. So settlers at this time, um, they one uh, settler famously said, or I think that many of them used to say that the river was um, too thin to too thin to plow and too thick to drink. And so there was this question about whether or not it even was a river. You know, is it water? Is it just is it thin land or is it thick water? Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, kind of this this perplexity that that um, constituted settlers' relationships to the water. So this is the famous flooding that created um, the Salton Sea. Um, I argue in the book that this is a co-production of human action and um, natural flooding that would occur over and over again. And again, can you all see a big body of water with telegraph poles? I uh, can kind of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's going on? Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, this is, I just like to show this image because um, settlers had built telegraph wires connecting Yuma to um, San Diego um, so that telegraph messages could be um, sent. And they were, you know, obviously like inundated by the water that came in, um, but they were still passing messages across this space. So settlers were kind of using this space um, even after the flooding happened. Um, but you can see that um, this the water was actually filling a great lake bed um, that historians and geologists have called Lake Kauia. Um, what you see there is the former lake bed of Lake Kauia, which is evidence that, it, it, you know, if you don't want to uh, listen to indigenous people's environmental histories, which I think you should, you can always follow the geology of these kinds of things. Uh, this is a massive inundation, a great uh, stand of water that would that would uh, flood from the Colorado River regularly, and this was a, is a really consistent part of desert people's um, environmental histories um, and origin stories. Um, and you can see there the, the kind of um, the borderlands of um, the indigenous nations um, where um, this flooding would take place. Um, because Erica has written so beautifully about um, the colonization of indigenous infrastructures, I wanted to talk a little bit about Kuya infrastructures. These are Kuya um, mesquite um, granaries um, that um, they built to preserve mesquite beans throughout um, uh, the seasons. The seasons were also named after the life cycle of mesquite beans. Um, and so it was a very important part of um, the way that Kuya life proceeds. Um, and I just also think that they're beautiful. Um, more about uh, mesquite-based infrastructure. This is Elena Levy, who's on the, the left, a member of the Torres Martinez um, tribe, photographed um, constructing one of these granaries in 1917. Um, and then here, again, just in thinking about infrastructures, um, it, you know, and infrastructure is not just being built by settlers. Um, this is a, an aquifer well that was built at Toro. Um, around 19, it was photographed around 1903. So the flooding um, inundated all of these um, wells that existed. This was the town of Imperial. Can you imagine looking out at that and just saying, <laughs> let's call it Imperial. Um, yeah, um, and, and the course of the flooding. So what you see highlighted here on the right is um, the mouth of the Colorado River. What you see highlighted um, kind of in the middle is where they located um, the town of Imperial. Um, water, of course, likes to flow downhill, um, or so I've been told. <laughs> Not a hydrologist, um, uh, but all the Colorado River needed to do was raise 47 feet to flood this great trough. So that's the Salton Trough where the Salton Sea now sits. And um, so I'll, uh, I just wanted to, to show some of these images and then I'll wrap up. These are some of the promotional uh, materials that were used by um, Salton Sea boards of trade and boards of commerce and those kinds of things. Um, throughout the 20th century. And the reason that I wanted to provide these um, is because um, the Salton Sea uh, and other kinds of settlements have been a really important part of management of the Colorado River uh, for the entire uh, 20th century in order to protect um, uh, non-native settlements from the um, from the, the life of a river, which mm -hmm. includes flooding, it includes high times. Um, and so protecting Imperial and the other settlements in the Imperial Valley from repeat flooding was a central part of what the project was in constructing things like the Hoover Dam and the Boulder Dam. Um, so getting the river under control was a central piece of this. Um, and one of the things that I like to point out is that while these massive infrastructural projects were taking place to protect these non-native settlements um, from flooding of the Colorado River, 
uh, they actually extended the Torres Martinez reservation underneath the stand of water after it had already been flooded. Um, and so it was this idea of building in an infrastructure that would continue to inundate the Torres Martinez reservation and it's still underwater. Um, and so these kinds of ways of using infrastructure to protect some uh, places and to, to engage in dispossession by inundation um, and other kinds of places. So again, the way that imperial boosters um, um, have understood themselves as being part of the lifeway of the Colorado River. Um, I'm going to skip through this. This is a story of um, a contaminant called perchlorate that washed into the Colorado. Well, maybe I won't. I'll just I'll say a couple of things about it. Um, perchlorate was being um, manufactured. It's a, uh, it's a rocket fuel ingredient, uh, and it was being manufactured at two plants um, that are sitting on the Las Vegas wash, um, which is what you see here. And without anybody knowing it, it was leaching into, or maybe some people know it, it was leaching into Lake Mead um, and sending ammonium perchlorate into Lake Mead and then into the Colorado River. Um, and what ended up happening is that nobody discovered that this was a problem until they started testing um, supermarket milk in Los Angeles and found that 100% of the samples of supermarket milk were contaminated with perchlorate. Um, and uh, shoppers in Los Angeles were not thinking of themselves as being part of the Colorado River watershed. Uh, but again, thinking about one of the things that really struck me as I was writing the book is one of the best ways to map the Colorado River watershed today it's actually by mapping perchlorate, uh, mapping it into cow bodies, into things like spinach and alfalfa, and then mapping it into um, human consumers' bodies. Um, so this is a, a, a recharge station um, where Colorado River water is being used to refill the aquifer with this contaminated, untreated Colorado River water. Um, and it's an aquifer that's been depleted by, by settler agriculturalism. So I can talk a little bit more about that. This is another recharge station. Um, so at a time when the Salton Sea is really understood as being um, an, uh, is an ecological and environmental health disaster, it's caused these massive fish and bird die-offs. If you've heard of the Salton Sea, you've probably heard of it because of these massive die-offs that have been happening um, because of its uh, kind of, its different kinds of toxicity. Um, these kinds of environmental catastrophes flow along with these histories of settler uh, mismanagement. Uh, one of the most um, keenly felt in the area is the problem of air pollution um, as the Salton Sea shoreline recedes um, and there's not enough um, Colorado River irrigation water flowing into it um, to sustain its levels. Uh, so the evaporation of the um, lake bed leaves behind this playa um, uh, sediment that's laced with all sorts of different kinds of pesticide related uh, contaminants that's creating massive uh, environmental health problems with particularly childhood asthma. Um, so these are the, the ways of thinking about, I pulled this from Google Images because it's one of my favorite ways to kind of map out the collective um, crisis brain. Um, so these are just some articles that have talked about Colorado River crisis, um, looming water battles, Colorado River on the brink, and it's just a kind of smattering of getting a sample, an AI generated sample of where we're at, <laughs> um, where we're thinking about current climate and um, catastrophe, um, and just to underscore what, what Andrew said. I'll leave on these final um, uh, examples of representations of the Salton Sea. Um, this was a um, poster contest that was done for um, Torres Martinez Calia children school children and they were asked to paint um, the past, present and future of the Salton Sea um, <clears throat> based on what they knew about it. Um, and so um, this is a, a painting that a, I think an eight year old did, you can see it got first place, mm -hmm. um, of a really vibrant um, sea surrounded by Kauai people who are doing a, um, a bird song dance um, and a place where um, fish and birds, this was done by a six year old, um, fish and birds and, and plants and mountains um, could thrive. So there is an imagined future for both the Colorado River and, and the Salton Sea. And this one I love in particular because I think that's the Colorado River. Hmm. So I'll end there. All right, well done. The framing of crisis, I've been thinking about a lot as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wrapped up a paper with 
Nick Wilson and, and other colleagues actually thinking about the discourse of crisis. And this comes out of this, this framing that we've been seeing over and over again, and you pointed to it in your last slide, um, that we are suddenly in this climate crisis. But I think as we try to show in various ways that this to historicize what crisis is, yeah. and you point to that through those newspapers in the 1960s, is that there's always been a discourse of crisis, but it's being reframed in different ways. We are just in a moment now where science tells us, oh, it's climate change. But you know, a cent half a century ago, um, you know, there was concerns about um, drought, or even in the Navajo Nation context, um, you know, what what led to um, you know these these federal impositions was that we didn't know how to manage our own land, right? And the livestock reduction. So there's always been these certain narratives of crisis um, that have have been used to to um, justify, you know, federal or you know settler impositions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm seeing that both within like water security and you know climate change and climate science. So that's kind of what the paper is that, that I've been like, working on. And, and actually the example that we point to is, is the Colorado River because that's um, at least in the middle of the Western United States, that is kind of like the most glaring example of that. Um, but as we know, this is, this has been, this is a fiction that it's something decent and it does obscure, you know, the colonial underpinnings mm -hmm. um, that have been here since the beginning. So that's, that's kind of, I mean, I think that's what we're trying to do in the book and maybe that helps. Mm -hmm. This conversation helps us. Oh, oh you need to point that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So read the book thing. I'm so sorry. What's useful I'll with these it, panels is it kind of, it, it helps us actually formulate mm -hmm. or what, what we want to do with, with this book. That so, you are going to discuss yeah, I mean, but, but I'll also say that so in, in environmental justice studies, we talk about like an environmental injustice and environmental racism, and that the inverse of that experience of this this um, like disproportionate allocation of environmental harm. The inverse of that that we don't talk enough about often is environmental privilege and how avoiding crisis until now, right? Not feeling like you're in crisis until now is a huge signifier of environmental privilege um you know to to suddenly be like oh wait we have done a really poor job allocating water resources um until now and so it's it's kind of like when does this crisis begin kind of maps onto um, people's privilege so let me um just say a couple of words about the book and i'll have to go back and share my screen again um, if anybody wants to to Greater infrastructure <laughs> or address the kind of idea of crisis. Okay. Yeah. okay, I made a QR code. <laughs> this is a QR code. So we are collectively working on um, a uh, edited collection um, on the Colorado River, and we are soliciting contributions. Um, we are very, very hopeful that it will be an interdisciplinary. Um, collection and also um, cross borders between um, social sciences, humanities, sciences, the STEM fields, and journalism or activism. Um, we're really interested in bringing together a kind of collage of um, voices on um, the state of the Colorado River, um, particularly with um, rim, rim, rim.